My name is Shelby Holmes. I'm a sophomore in college, and I was raised in Sealy Lake and the Swan Valley area. Um, that is part of Western Montana, which is part of the southwestern crown of the continent. When I was a student at Sealy Lake and uh, Sealy Swan High School, the science classes were very hands-on. The teachers at Sealy Lake and Sealy Swan High School are very hands-on and their dedication and passion for the outdoors inspired a lot of these students, including me. As a junior high student, um, one of the projects we did was monitor the Smorel Creek. The project that I was a part of when I was a student is still ongoing for the junior high students today. At Sealy Swan High School, there is a Geography of Foods class where the students get to participate in a greenhouse and also learn about locally grown food. Sealy Lake is not the only place where kids are getting involved. The students in Ovando are learning how drought will affect them and their streams. When I came back this year for the summer, I noticed a change in the Sealy Swan area. The climate was a lot drier. The mountains had little to no snow on them. The streams were very low. It's not what I expected to see when I came home. Left me with a lot of questions. Questions like, what does this mean for the future of this incredibly beautiful area? Uh, who and what does this affect? And is anyone doing anything to help? I found that local students are concerned about the quality of their food and that much of their food travels an average of 1,500 miles before it gets to this part of Montana. Their answer? Growing local food in the Sealy Swan High School greenhouse. We all eat food, and if we can grow it ourselves, uh, it can be more internally satisfying. Uh, it's likely that if you do it in a responsible way, you have a much smaller carbon footprint than any other way. We uh, harvest the crops in the greenhouse. We uh, pick each of these beds and we clean them off and then we stuff them into bags for the community to eat. Well, you know where it comes from, so you're not worried about, like, I don't know, pesticides. It tastes a lot sweeter, which makes it taste a lot better. I wasn't expecting it to taste so good. Because growing up with, like, store-bought stuff, you just kind of expect, you know, just normal flavors. But this is a lot more flavorful than anything I've had before. Yeah, it's really good. We eat a lot of it, a lot more than when we just have our salad that we right. bought at the store. Right. That if at 47 degrees latitude we can have greens in January using nothing that's plugged mm -hmm. in, that at least makes these guys think and uh, come up with, with other ways to, I don't know, have an impact I in their future, I guess. If the argument of local food may be part of the puzzle, but not all the puzzle. When you buy locally, your food on average traveled 50 miles. Now that's a lot less than if you had not bought locally. Food miles is a way to calculate how far your food travels. The transportation of food pollutes, and that affects the people and the environment. As far as carbon footprint, a lot of people use the term of food miles, and it's more complicated oh. than food miles because it depends on what sort of transportation you're using. After participating in the Sealy Swan High School Greenhouse Project, Abby Lorenz, a student at Sealy Swan, wanted to learn more about the impact of transportation of food on the climate. So she sat down with Bonnie Buckingham of the Food and Community Agricultural Coalition. Yeah, the dependence on fossil fuels to get our food to especially rural areas that are kind of removed from the urban centers is immense. You know, you, you go to the grocery store, you, you're looking at all the different food choices, and any time that you choose local food, you really are reducing, in a big way, your carbon footprint. And so when we buy a cabbage from who knows where, we don't know how many miles that cabbage traveled. We don't know how many gallons of gas it took to get there. We don't know what kind of practices the the farmer used. And so there's all of these 
external costs that we don't really see when we just look at a cabbage sitting on the shelf in the grocery store. But we are paying those costs, and a lot of them are environmental costs. I think that young people such as you are really the key to making change. It makes me want to kind of like grow a garden, to be honest, because I think it's kind of cool seeing what you plant it into something that you can eat. Morrow Creek is one of the best bull trout habitats in the country. The flow, temperature, and quality of water is perfect for the fish. Bull trout are native to Montana, and they are an indicator of a healthy creek. So, because they are still there means we have a really good creek. The bull trout species is declining, but Morrell is a great place because it's cold, clean, and they can live in it, and they can thrive in it. We're one of the only schools in the state, in the country, that gets to actually go up and monitor a creek, handle live fish, do studies for the state. Mm -hmm. So it's really a neat opportunity. The fish. So we're going to go out in the stream and we're going to use an electrofisher. We're going to shock the fish and you're going to net them. Oh, we're electrofishing to see uh, how many fish are in the uh, stream and what, kind, what types of fish are in here. Make sure they still have bull trout in here. When the guy from the state comes up, he has this long rod with a hoop on the end, which emits an electrical charge. And as he does that, the fish will float up to the top because they're stunned. And then when we get a certain way up the creek, we, um, we stop and then go over to the bank. And with the sedated fish, we record like what species they are and then how long they are. Today we're looking for bull trout um, because Bull trout kind of will tell us if the stream is healthy or uh, if everything's going right in the Morrell Creek. The bull trout is one of the purest, healthiest wild living organisms in the aquatic system. They like the dark, they like clean water, and they need cold. When you find them, they indicate a healthy creek. They spawn and live in the Morrell Creek. When we see them, it just means good things for our watershed. We're taking water samples to test the creek for its levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. We send it to a lab in the flathead. Depending on which nutrient is added to the water, it'll either it'll promote the growth of some things that will take over that ecosystem. And over time, our samples will be able to tell if the health of the creek is either getting worse, if it's getting better, if it's staying the same. So another thing we test for is dissolved oxygen and colder water holds more dissolved oxygen. So when we do that test, we really wanna make sure that the, dissolve, the dissolved oxygen rate is higher and well, at average level so that we know that the water is staying cold and that the fish really like the oxygen in the water. I think bull trout, I know they have to have clean, they have to have cold water. Very cold water. If there's a climate change yeah. and you'll have no oxygen with warm water and it'll kill off the fish. A lot of people sometimes can think that climate change isn't a real problem, that the temperature getting warmer doesn't matter because it snows in the winter, when in reality it could have a huge impact on what we see around us in the lakes and the streams. It all depends on what we're doing to the environment. <laughs> I'd like to keep sea as nice as we possibly can. So we have a nice lake so in the summertime when it's warm out you can go swimming, go tubing. We need to take care of what we have left and that when we have a problem that we need to figure out how to fix it and take care of our ecosystem and our environment. Yeah, my dad is huge into the save the bull trout stuff. So is my mom, so we all get it. The year 2015 had record low flows in the Blackfoot River. This is due to the lack of spring rain and early melting snowpack. People in this area have come to depend on the river. To help the anglers, river guides, and ranchers during the drought, the Blackfoot Challenge in the small town of Ovando has coordinated the drought response plan. Ovando, where are we? We are in the middle of absolutely nowhere amongst ranch lands in the big Blackfoot Valley, made famous by a river runs through it. My um, boss said, um, 
this is your mantra coming into this job, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. And so, you know, historically, water rights can have been a contentious issue in the West. Obviously, water is what is at, you know, it's at the heart of the survival of these ranches. So when the water starts getting really low and really hot like it did in June and there's the oxygen level is so decreased that the fish are struggling on a daily basis. This year we knew this was coming. Mm -hmm. We know it's coming again next year. That said, um, our, our ranchers and our fishing outfitters all work very well together under the Blackfoot Drought Response Plan. We call it a program of shared sacrifice. So that they're all playing their part and it sort of lessens the burden on any one individual right. to help keep water in the river, conserve river flows. You know, partnership's been really big in the Blackfoot mm -hmm. Valley. Mm -hmm. This mutual, what do they call it, uh, mutual sacrifice yeah. where we'll quit fishing if y'all quit taking water out. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of like unheard of in a lot of places and it works. Yeah. They participate because they know that sharing the burden helps everybody. Once the temperatures in the river start to climb above 65, 68 degrees, mm -hmm. it becomes um, challenging for the native fish. Um, we also have impacts on our local agricultural communities mm -hmm. because they rely on the surface water in this watershed to support their ranch operations. We're just now asking irrigators to put their plans in place. Most of them are telling me they already did it. So that says something how they watch river flows, how they pay attention, and how they're committed to this process. And then we're going to talk about how the Blackfoot Challenge and the community respond to drought, um, because drought has an effect on our community. And so I'm just going to give a little presentation on how the community here works together to respond to the event of drought. Learning about the importance of water conservation and drought starts early with the 13 students at the Ovando School. They also actively monitor the local streams to record the depth, flow, temperature, and turbidity in the stream. Somebody was fishing at Monsure, and those kids stood up to that fisherman and told him, you know, there's no fishing after two o'clock, and when he didn't move, it was like glaring down an entire classroom of kids. They weren't going to let him back on the river again. <laughs> I was so proud of them. <laughs> they learn a little bit about flow. They learn what lives in the river, and they learn what happens when flows get low, mm -hmm. and how that impacts um, the life in the river, and also impacts their parents and their grandparents and those who are working the land. Those kids are awesome. Um, the school around here, I know they're at Warren Creek, and they're taking of you know temperatures and they're keeping an eye on things and I love that they're being so proactive I love that they are getting out into the field and learning that way so we have um, initiated some form of drought response nine out of the last 15 years mm -hmm. and we um, are starting to use the words the new normal um, so I think for us that's uh, that's definitely something that our residents, ranchers, and, and fishing outfitters are all talking about. This, this is our new normal. Mm -hmm. We're going to see less snowpack. We're going to see it coming off the mountains earlier in the year. We are going to see hotter summers. Um, and so certainly people are starting to look at this not like it's going to happen once every 10 years or a couple times in 10 years, but this is something we have to deal with in the long term. Students will be the change. The students at Sealy Swan, the students at Sealy Lake, and the students at Ovando, they understand this and they understand that there is a problem. Uh, the students will make the difference and the kids understand that it's their responsibility to help. My hope is that this is just the beginning and that more students will get involved, more schools will get involved, and more kids will learn that they can help.